you. Good morning. Congratulations to those of you who made it. And I, I just want to read a message I got this morning from one of the festival attendees that explains the empty room. Hmm? If by you accidentally drank till 9 a.m., gonna sleep till 3. <laughs> So, well done to those who are still here despite drinking till 9 a.m. But I wanted to give you a little update on the protests. Uh, there was another one last night. Uh, there will be another one today. Uh, the story is developing. Yesterday, the Speaker of Parliament resigned. Uh, the demonstrators are asking for more resignations, the Interior Minister, and um, especially the Interior Minister, and the new election. Uh, the, uh, and then yesterday, uh, Putin um, ordered Russian airlines to stop flights uh, to Georgia because it's not safe enough for the, uh, for, for the Russians. We have actually Russians on the team, and I uh, just want to tell you that you are safe <laughs> and we love you. So, um, uh, yeah, that's basically the update from, from the demonstrations. And over to Ninutsa, I think. Okay, thank you, Natalia, so much. Um, so it is tr it is true actually that we are um, we are facing the story in development. Um, yesterday, I was sitting next to one of. Oh, you forgot something. I'm sorry. <laughs> I also drank too much last night. <laughs> There was one thing that we wanted to show you, uh, and that's something that's making its rounds on social media in Georgia. Sofiko, can you put it on? So several people, uh, this has become the, uh, new, um, uh, the new slogan for the protests because uh, two people have actually lost their uh, eyes. Two people lost an eye each. And uh, these are the, um, the, the posters that demonstrators brought, and they're all over the social media in Georgia as well. So. Here's that, how that story is shaping up. Yeah, I think it, it is really creative and uh, really inspiring to see so many designs and posters going around the social media and also so many um, companies trying to join the movement and do something about this. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, session this morning, um, which is called Art of the Long Form. We have Peter Pomerantsev, who directs the Arena Initiative at the London School of Economics, and his new book, This Is Not Propaganda, which has Unicorn on its cover page, uh, will be out in August. Um, and he'll be having conversation with John Lee Anderson, who you already know from yesterday. So, gentlemen, please take the stage. I guess these are the people who haven't stopped drinking from last night. They've just gone on. Um, so, John. Yes. We were, you know, we're meant to talk about long form. And I'm assuming a lot of the people here are actually, you know, practitioners. Um, and so, you know, a highly well-informed audience. How many are yeah. practitioners? Who, who, who here is a journalist? Yeah. So almost everybody, but not everybody. Not everyone, okay. So maybe okay. seven out of ten, yeah. But still, what, I think we need to define our terms. What is long form? Is it anything longer than a tweet? Is that, is that where long form starts? It's a valid question nowadays. <clears throat> no, I think long form is, is something, uh, you know, 3,000 words and on. Some people might say 2,500. I don't know what those long reads in The Guardian are, but I think that's, that's long form. Um, you know, there's, there's the kind of circumscribed essay or, or commentary piece. There's the, there's the feature-length reportage in a daily that I think we're, we're all used to seeing. They might be a page in The New York Times or something like that. Um, but a long form piece in my book is something in the region of um, minimum 6,000 uh, to anywhere up to 15,000 words. My, my length is sort of 10,000, uh, between 7 and 10 nowadays. It's gone down a little bit from the 10 to 12. I think of the, new, my, I write for the New Yorker of maybe, um, you know, 
a decade ago. Um, in general, the long form, I think, has gotten shorter. Uh, but it's why? still quite why, why, why has it got shorter? Long. I think it's a reflection of the times we live in and the fact that everybody's aware that we all have less time and probably a lot of our waking hours are taken up by staring into the magic mirror. Um, and, um, so was that an editorial decision? Did like, no, David Remnick say, okay, the new, the new attention span is 9,000 and not 13,000? There, there, you know, there hasn't been a kind of diktat, an official diktat like that, but I've noticed it in the, the evolution. I have been 20 years with The New Yorker, and I think in the first 10, my pieces were in the 10 to 12 range, mostly, some a little longer, a few shorter. And in the last seven, six, seven years, it's gone down to about seven to nine, seems to be the new normal. And, I, and so, you know, the dark arts of editorship, they, they don't, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and you don't, you aren't told exactly, you just become aware. So, so it's not that's like, the way the New Yorker works. So, so it's not, you don't get an email from your editor saying, okay, we need 9,000 words on this, or we need no. 10,000 words no, on this. No, the way it works with my editor is, we agree on a story. I know not to ask how many words I'm going to get. And I go out assuming that I'm going to get a hell of a long piece out of whatever I do, because that's, that's the ultimate utopia, is to be able to find the perfect story that nobody will care about its length. And I write usually with that kind of optimism in mind. And I never ask my editor. It's a kind of, maybe other writers do, but I never do. I, I like the smoke and mirrors of possibility because I don't like to be constrained beforehand. And maybe they know that about me. So I'm kept a little bit in the dark. But hold on, isn't it a financial it's thing It's a bit as like well? a marriage, I'm you know? You, you don't ask certain things of your wife or spouse after a certain number of times. You just kind of know things. And so... Um, is, your wife, is your wife your editor? No. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that's because she's English. I don't know. <laughs> but the, the, sometimes I do ask my editor, when we're getting close to... When we're in the edit, I send in my screed that's, you know, abysmally long. And then once we're in the edit, I not then begin to think, okay, what am I going to lose? At some point, if I get really insecure, I'll ask, so what kind of words are we talking about? And usually I get back a very ambiguous response, like, whatever we can make it. And what? that continues until quite close to publication time. And so there is this kind of um, mutual, maybe deceit, <laughs> or not deceit, mutual a kind of complicity where we enter into this creative uh, teamwork, which is the editing process, in which my words get whittled away. Sometimes I have to add things that seem to be missing, and the editor will ask me, you know, I don't know, what about such and such? And I throw things in. Once the editing process begins, you kind of lose track of length. And then it ends up whatever it's going to end up. And usually I lobby for more words. And usually my editor will also lobby for more words. And he goes and talks to a certain person. I've never met this person who can be lobbied on the side. Sort of, we can squeeze an extra 800 or 1,000 words out of her. I don't know whether he bats his eyelids at her or, you know, I don't know what they do. They miss a cartoon. And I, you know, I've never known why. For instance, there has to be a cartoon on that page, which you know represents 400 words for me, or 500 words, and I resent those cartoons. What? What? Um. But you just said the the story. So can you? There's a story. When you encounter it, does it have a certain word weight? So let's say the story of this protest. Is this a? Does it feel 600 words to you? These protests? Do they feel 5,000 words to you? Is it a, a 10,000 word protest? It's not a 10,000 word protest, not yet. <laughs> How many words do this, these protests get? Well, I would give it over 1,000 because of the blinding and because of Russia. Um, P so Putin gives it if you 600 me, words. If you asked me this last night, I would have said, eh, you know, maybe 1,000 words. But before he banned the, started Putin banning the flights. Putin is great at word count. He's good at word count. I would say, and part of it has to do with context because I'm coming in as a, in a sense, if I, I would be coming in as a parachutist, which is not a situation I like to be in for a place like this, which is so complex and has so much history. And I'm very aware of it because I, I have friends who've 
been here for many years and, and I'm hearing from them. You know, I ask a simple question like, what's going on? And I get 45 minutes on the factions that are there in the crowd. And I realize, you know, oh shit. I Georgians are all long form. Georgians are all it's natural very long, long form, form writers. They're oral <laughs> long form. So the, the, so podcasters. The, the, pro the problem is I'm very aware of how much I don't know. So I would have to, and of course, a protest doesn't give you much more than a news bulletin. So what, where do you go from there? If I was here, if I was to then come in here and say, maybe I would go away from here and say, you know, something's brewing in Georgia. You probably saw it on the news. I think I could pull together a story about, you know, <clears throat> this ongoing, you might have forgotten about it, but there is this ongoing push me, pull you with Russia and Georgia, and there, is the, there are these unreconciled or unresolved, uh, the unresolved sovereignty somehow of Georgia is maybe the story and why that's the case. So you have to have an idea that would draw you in. And if I could convince Remnick, who after all knows a lot about this part of the world, that I was the right person to do it, which I probably wouldn't be the right person, um, you know, he might say, okay, let's, sometimes I'm told the word length beforehand. Um, you know, I would say maybe I could aspire to a 5,000 word piece, which is, it sounds, it's modest in New Yorker terms. But for a piece as complex as this, uh, and to represent Georgia, I suppose, to the New Yorker readers, that would be an adequate link. Because it's still free form, it's still ambiguous. There's not a, uh, you, you would be here in search of the story within the story. Well, exactly, that's what I wanted to get to, because what is the difference between, you know, most, most journalism's information and trying to make that digestible, but if you're spending, I mean, how long do you spend working on these long-form things in New York? A, a few months? Five? Yeah, three months, four months. So that means you have to be looking beyond the immediate news bite. Yeah. So how do you find that, what is the story within the story? How do you find that? And how do you ensure that it's relevant? Because if you're working on something six months, you know, by the time, by the time it comes out, how, how do you make sure that it's still going? I can speed up. <laughs> you know, I can speed up. I have done, gone into places that are very dynamic, um, war zones or catastrophes, and turned a piece around in a week. It's, you know, it's very adrenal, but I still have the same pretension, which is to turn in a piece with with a story that, that tells something original and that can compete with whatever the dailies have been covering every day, the New York Times or whoever. And it's not a news weekly, so I'm thinking of the Haitian earthquake or the New Orleans uh, hurricane disaster uh, or the bombing of Baghdad or whatever it is. And so the idea is to have a piece that feels timely and has enough length to give people that want to get beyond the chaos and the insufficiency of daily news uh, absorption, um, something they can sink their teeth into, um, something a little deeper. That's the pretension. I, I'm, it, what comes to mind as I speak is um, in the week before the bombing of Baghdad, I um, I'd been doing some historical reading. I was in Baghdad, and I ended up doing a piece about the 1920 um, uh, uprising against the Brits, which happened to be in the area of Fallujah and Abu Ghraib, which was very shortly to become iconic in the new Iraq war. And that felt right to me. And so I was able to, I was in a very constrained reporting environment because it was Saddam's Iraq, but I could do that. And so I was able to go out to Abu Ghraib, which wasn't just the prison, it's also a tribal area, and Fallujah, and to, and to various graveyards, the British graveyards, it was very atmospheric. And I was able to paint a piece and remind American readers of the history of so many years before. And it was a kind of um, cautionary, I, that's how I felt. I felt that I needed to do a kind of cautionary tale. And the cautionary tale was in the history which nobody was talking about in this rush to war. But so each moment in a kind of dynamic situation I think imposes its own exigency and you look for what you need. And it's a kind of an intuitive or an instinctive process, partly intellectual, but also in my case I think partly instinctive. Once, because I'm in the place, I'm 
my senses are all operating. I'm trying to answer questions that I have. And sometimes my editors can be ext extremely helpful. I mean, Thomas, who's sitting in the audience, will remember because we, we came in in early 2000, uh, just after the 9-11 attacks from Tajikistan into the north of uh, Afghanistan and made our way to Kabul. It took a couple of months, and we were at various last stands of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and so on, and we made our way across this country. And um, I was very aware that I was exploring an almost unknown landscape to the Americans who were now going to war in this place. And I had some, I had been in this country 13 years before and felt that I could, that w the most thing I needed to do, knowing my countrymen, was to try to caution them about not objectifying this entire population. So I was looking for the, mm, I was looking for human stories and also stories about, that went deeper into the culture. But, but still these stories needed to come out at a time when the war was going to be going on. And my editor, I remember we talked to her at vast expense with satellite phones um, over the course of this, it was actually about a three month period. Um, and she, she was really valuable to me because at the time you were completely cut off, there was no cell phone coverage. Um, and, um, and she would tell me what people were asking in New York. She was saying, you know, what people want to know here is this. What people are chattering about is this. And, you know, and it would give me a clue as to maybe, because when you go native, you really go native. You, you forget New York. I don't remember New York. She was my lifeline to a kind of intellectual quest that wasn't being resolved in the dailies, and that helped inform my, I, my search. I was going to ask, because so you, if you're given so much time, three, six months, plus a hinterland of years, how do you know when you've got it? How do you know when to stop? Is it like a... I mean... Again, so I was talking just now about the kind of more news, newsy, yeah. long-form pieces where you want, to be, you want to be original, you want to say something deeper, you want it to be lasting. You maybe don't want it to, you know, the, I, I'm not going to go there about if it's literature or not, but you want people, obviously, to read it and to remember it. You want maybe to influence minds, especially if it's in the case of a conflict where people's lives are at stake. It's less important if you're writing about, I don't know, basketball or something. But, um, but uh, then there are profile pieces which are, are less kinetic, less, you know, so I'm doing a profile of, a, say, a political leader or a writer or something in somewhere. And um, that's more of a biographical approach, but you still have to set them in their time. And, and each, and depending on your access, the time you need and the length you need uh, is is contingent on the story you find, but you you I think I've over time I've developed a sense of what I think I need, and I came out of a, a, a when I before the five years before I worked at the New Yorker, I'd written a book that took me five years, which was a biography. So I approached my work at the New Yorker almost as a biographer, and a lot of my early pieces were in fact profiles. The, the longest I spent on one was seven months. That was of Garcia Marquez. And I knew what I need. I have a high uh, watermark uh, of what I think I need. And usually the editor is there to tell you, you that's enough, you know, time to come in. Um, but you always, as the writer, as the researcher and the writer, you want more. You know, yes, but I didn't sleep in bed with, her, you know, them. but I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't... Um, go skiing with, you know, you want to, you want to see the person in a variety of, of circumstances. You want to live with them. You want to see how they see the world. You don't just want the set piece Q&A. That doesn't give you, an interview with your subject doesn't give you the story. You still need the story. What is the story? The story is that person's truth or the closest to that truth you can get. The truth you feel that's there and you need to tell. And then it's up to you to decide do you need to tell just the public life, the personal life, or the secret life? Do you need it all? Is it fair of you to tell the secret life? And, or maybe if it's a public official, yeah, you need the secret life. If it's um, a colleague or, I don't know, a historical figure, maybe it's not necessary. And am I being too vague? But, let me, let but, me, no, 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 that's but, fantastic. But, but, but then there's pieces uh, like, hmm, 
I just did a, a piece in Venezuela, which took me two trips, and also there, and a trip to Washington, to figure out what was going on at this very, it was a dynamic period. You probably all remember at the beginning of the year, suddenly there was this alternative president in the opposition, and it became very confusing. Trump was talking about it all the time, and now nobody's talking about it because Trump's lost interest. But is this fellow Juan Guaido, and they were going to invade Nica uh, Venezuela, and everything. Maduro became the new Attila the Hun, and it was like it's 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 a real disinformation war of of of, of like few scenarios I've ever seen in my ad adult life. It is. You, and you're a master at uh, understanding what's going on in this new world of disinformation, to call it something. But in, in terms of a conflict arena, a potential conflict arena, rarely have I seen so much black, the black arts of propaganda at work. And so as a reporter, it was my job not only to try and report, get access to report as best as I could the actual situation, but also to negotiate all of that bullshit, and to somehow report it all as a, set, as a piece. It took me about three months. And in the end, it ends on, um, I, I did get close to Juan Guaido, the, this kind of, the talented young Juan Guaido. And in the end, he comes, I think I got his measure, and it comes across in the piece. Um, the, and, and, and I needed to tell a kind of chronology so in, in my, what was my pretension in, as a journalist, I suppose, in, what was the New Yorker's pretension in this case? It was to, it was to, 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 to tell the defining story. That, I mean, that's the pretension. If you can't compete on a daily basis, so I'm not gonna get worried that, say, the New York Times reported something about gold mining in the South last week or something else the week before or t tomorrow. What I'm doing is I'm telling May, or I'm trying to tell the piece. This is what you need to know about Venezuela in this time. You know, so it may take us three months, but when you read it, hopefully you think, okay, now I get it. But, what, yeah. but what's the methodology? So you collect, collect, collect months and months of testimony and research, and then you come home and you dump it out and you start cooking with it, or, or you're constantly writing and sending to your editor and, and building it slowly? Um, in in the, this in this, this this case, because it had this, it was very. Um, it was like, you know, it's like running around a field trying to lasso a running horse. That Is this about your marriage or your the, the editing again? <laughs> Both. <laughs> that keeps changing place, and uh, and um, and and not being trained in lassoing, maybe. <laughs> So uh, it's difficult. You need to ride with it as long as you can and, and, and until you feel that there's some, some clarity. And it took the time it took to have that clarity because there wasn't an end that made too much sense. But you and, and, you, and so, so, so what I do in those cases is, yes, I collect, I take notes, I'm talking, I'm resolving, I'm, and I finally know when I got it, and I go home, and I write, and I send a draft to my editor. Usually three weeks later, it takes me about three weeks to write one of these pieces, usually. And, but, but there are pieces that I've written in place, in place because of the deadline, and I w usually send, dis I send like sections. Um, uh, and, and, you know, when it's, when it's a lot of uh, pressure on, I send sections to my editor so that the writing process begins and the thinking process begins while I'm still reporting and there is a, an element of trust there to the editor, usually if you're on a very tight deadline, to assemble those pieces for you. As a writer, as the reporter, the integrity for me is in my, is in how I see it. It's my story. It's I, my, the, the way I've decided to frame it, it's the people I've chosen to see. It's the story I've chosen to tell. Th so the integrity or the, uh, uh, for me is in, and if, it's, if there's any good writing, or I think there's good writing, you want that to come out. As to the actual statistics you cite and what else, there's no ego invested there. You know what I mean? But, but and that's about, what we have fact checkers for. But, but talking about ego, or rather more specifically, 
the use of the first person. I mean, the way you talk about this is a very, very sort of personalized journey of exploration, really. So do you find yourself relying on the first person narrator? And what are the pitfalls of that? And how have you learned to manage that in a way to not, to, you know, to, to not put the reader off? Or... Yeah, um, it's funny. Um, I'll go back to Haiti because I remember um, in Haiti I went the day after the earthquake I arrived. You know, 200,000 people had just died. People were in shock. I arrived and I had to immediately begin trying to find the story within the story. On about the third day, I saw a young woman cross the street, followed, and she was very stately, she was quite beautiful, and amidst all of this chaos and horror, people were still dying under the rubble, maybe 30,000 people, you could hear them at night crying, it was awful. Um, uh, there's this extraordinary looking woman of about 30 walking across the street, and with, followed by a, a, like a Pied Piper, you know, of young, like teenagers, small. And about five years, and uh, five, and the guy was driving me around. We both noticed her. And she exchanged a glance with us. And then about five hours later, down in Port-au-Prince, in the swelter and the chaos down there, we saw her and her children again. And so we stopped and we asked her what she was doing. And she said, that her, she told her name. Her name was Nadia Francois. And she was looking for food for her community. And her community was up there on the hill where we first seen her. And it turned out to be a barranco, a riverbed, a slum, I mean, proper slum, little one called Fidel, named for Fidel Castro, with about maybe, I don't know, 2,000 people living in shacks in a crevasse. Anyway, we helped her get food. We had a pickup truck. I could get into the compound where the Dominican army was handing out food supplies, but they weren't letting just anybody in. So I piled her and her kids in, and we got her a few food boxes, drove her back, saw Fidel. At the time, I wasn't thinking story so much as just the situation. Anyway, she did end up becoming my focus. It was, she was a kind of heroine or an anti-heroine because she was, she was actually um, kind of a criminal. She'd been deported three times from the United States. She's been in jail. But she was, in this circumstances, a heroine. You could call it a redemption story. We were talking about that. She, she, she conformed to one of our mythological, uh, uh, one of our few mythological constructs, I suppose. But again, I wasn't even thinking of that at the time. Later, I did the story. I wrote the story. I went up, and it turned out that a few days after I was in, this is a long way of answering your question, but you'll see the point. I was invited to go and talk at it Harvard. Is it is long form, so you're allowed. Yeah, exactly. So I had breakfast with the Neiman Fellows at Harvard. The Neiman Fellows are the... It's a journalist fellowship that people win, and it's considered quite a privilege. And they asked me to come to breakfast or whatever. And I told them the story, and there was this one young woman who was fixated by this, the fact that I had helped Nadia Francois. And I had written about it in the piece. We didn't hide it. So I'm, yes, I'm in the story. Not throughout, but there's a moment at which I describe how I meet her. I'm pretty sure it's in the story how I piled them in the truck, and, or maybe I just told it, I actually, this, and now I'm saying it, I can't remember. But I was very open about the fact that I'd helped her. Yeah. And this, this young woman said, you know, do you feel you committed an ethical um, transgression as a journalist by, you know, by becoming part of the story, by helping her, by intervening? And I was like, I got furious. I was furious. I said, uh, I didn't commit any ethical transaction. In fact, I think I behaved just as any human being should behave in such a situation. As a journalist, you can never make the mistake of not intervening when, it's, when you have the opportunity to help somebody who's an extremist, for fuck's sake. You know, I got really mad. And um, she later got, wrote a snarky blog about it. But, <laughs> you know, but the, you know, you can't make the mistake of not intervening when you have the opportunity to, especially if someone's life or is at stake or it's in a situation like that. And so I needed to write about that. I needed to be upfront about it. In those sorts of ca cases, yes, I'm in the story where, where the dialogue I, ha I might have with somebody uh, enhances the piece. I think it's, uh, it's good to be in it because if you lose that back and forth, it can be very revealing. Um, you know, how, how else do you tell it? I was telling you earlier that I have a colleague at the New Yorker who's quite an extraordinary 
writer Larissa McFarker, and she does these profiles of extraordinary people, Harold Bloom, um, you know, Noam Chomsky, and she not only gets the access, but learns whatever it is they do, she deconstructs it for you, and you know, she, she gets it. You know she does when you read her stuff. And she explains what it is they do, these extraordinary people. But she also edits herself out of the stories entirely, which is not an easy thing to do. If you're sitting in the kitchen with them and something occurs, you're aware the person's there, but it reads like a, in, in a sense, it reads like a screenplay. So, you know, the, you know uh, but it's not so easy to do. I'm not so, f I'm not fussed about it. Um, so if I have to be, I'm there. Usually we try to cut me out. But if I have to be there, I'm there. And you, the whole thing about the voyage of discovery, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I became a journalist was because I, had a str I have a strong s sense of adventure. I wanted to explore the world. I want to be a witness of history. I want to go places. There's certain countries I still get excited, or regions that I still get a boyish excitement about the prospect of going. And if, and if a story or, or, that I propose or that I'm, I'm assigned to contains the elements of, of adventure or discovery for me, it's, uh, I, I'm thrilled. And that, to me, is part of what I do, I think. So, do you, you've mentioned this redemption story idea. So do you find, when you do these long pieces, that you do end up actually doing certain archetypal stories? You know, we're always told in the, you know, these books you can buy, there's like five types of story, you know, the prodigal son, the fallen whore, or whatever. Is there actually like five, do you end up, do you actually find that beneath the fallen the nun, news, not the fallen whore. Yeah, yeah. the fallen nun. Well, not the, the horse can't fall. The horse Nuns can. can, but you know. Anyway, okay. whatever they are. <laughs> um, but um, do you find you add, end up telling archetypal stories beneath the news, or is it always a, a kind of a new newsy kind of story? A new what? Is it, is it always an information story? Do you end up just no, no, it's doing not these always mythological... an information story. No, I mean, Juan Guaido is an extraordinary character in a way, and I was trying to tell the story of this bizarre situation in which you have two presidents, right? And how how is that possible, right? So it's newsy in the sense that it's in our zeitgeist, it's in our awareness. People want to understand this confusing situation. And it was my challenge to try to tell it in a way that people could understand it. But it was, I was also telling a, a kind of a fascinating human dynamic. I'm not sure that conforms to one of our, you know, the five set pieces uh, uh, yeah, of, of, you know, of, of, of the Greek comedies or tragedies or Shakespeare. Occasionally you're aware, wow, this is Shakespearean or this is like this scene in King Lear and you're aware of it. But I don't go out thinking that way. I, it's not, I don't do it paint by numbers, you know. I, my, my approach to journalism isn't, you know, I did a comedy last time, I wanted a tragedy this time, or a redemption tale. It just happens. And, and sometimes within a piece there are many of these stories. But mythology is something I find interesting. One of the things that has always attracted me, if I, if I had to define what I do, within the art of long form, or what I do, it's two things. Um, one is, I've long had an interest in the organization of violence, which somehow lies at the heart of all nation state constructs as well as politics. I've always been fascinated at what point bloodshed is no longer visible, and once the former warlord puts on a suit and tie, he's legit. Um, so I've always been fascinated by that, mo that crucible moment in power, in the exercise of power, which is why I've done a lot of profiles of characters who have achieved power violently. And I try to engage them and have access to them and get their understanding of power. And if I judge them, it's usually in their exercise of justice. So that's one thing. And the other so it's thing, almost like biblical stories. It's I like, suppose. You know, I suppose. And the, yes, I suppose. Maybe we can't get away from it. Um, it's. I mean, these are good questions because I, it's not something I've thought about regularly and or or particularly deeply. But I suppose you know there's a strong element of truth to that. What you, 
the other the other thing I do I think is an exploration of of mythologies because we construct them and that's part of the same process of the legitimation of violence which we see at the core of all politics as I said all the construction creation of all nation states and in my view all religions I've even gotten to the point where I wondered whether religion in fact was a justification for the shedding of blood because at some level the moment of sacrifice uh, lies at the genesis of many of the particularly monotheistic religions so anyway I um, I'm always I've always have an ear cocked to that so and that's something I do I look for in my stories but it's now a kind of um, it's not such a conscious process. But if, now thinking about, of your many great books, maybe the one you're best known for, which is the biography of Che Guevara, that is all those themes. That is an yeah. icon, the justification of violence. Um, so he was kind of like, you know, someone that brought together all these themes. And what is it like approaching, because literally he is an icon. I don't think metaphorically, literally he's an icon. He's on yeah. people's t-shirts. How do you even approach handling an iconic figure like that? Well, I had previously done a book, which was a journalistic book. It was a journalistic exploration of the, of the world of insurgency. I spent about four and a half years traveling the world, living with different guerrilla groups of every type, and trying to find the, common, um, the commonalities between them and certain maxims that guided their existence. Because at the time I did this, there were about 40 or 50 insurgencies around the world. Some had been in the bush or mountains for three generations, and they'd created their own creation myths, they had their own societies, it was mostly unwritten, um, and, I've, and I broke down my search uh, according to, uh, in, in chapters in which I was able to look at them for uh, the ways they lived their life and constructed their lives. How different were they to us? And, ha and how common were they to us? The difference they had with all of the rest of us was that they had all crossed a line, an invisible line, and decided to live a life in which death was the most imminent certainty rather than life, which was fascinating to me because it was something that transcended every culture I could see, every race I could imagine, every religion, and had also guided mankind since pre-recorded times. It still does today, but nowadays we don't, nobody's called a gorilla anymore. So um, that led me to Che who seemed to incarnate all of these qualities. And um, so I began with the icon, you're right. And I went and moved to Cuba, and I found for about a year, I quickly established a rapport, a working rapport with his widow, who'd never previously collaborated with anybody. And it was, it was tough going. What did, you, what did you tell her to make her open up? Um, I gave her, I did my spiel. Which was? That I really, you know, I had just come out of the guerrillas experience. I think I talked about, um, along the lines of, uh, maybe a little less guardedly than I just did, but I basically said that everywhere I went, people were either emulating or venerating Che Guevara, and he'd ceased to be talked about in the mainstream world, but he was very alive in the world of insurgency where I'd been living and traveling, and I wanted to know more about him, and I wanted to write a book that told his truth. And at the very end, I, and I remember sweating furiously through this, and she's a stern woman, very shy but stern. And at the end of it, she was silent. And I said, um, will you cooperate with me? And she st stared at me long and hard, and she gave a kind of, mm, <laughs> like that. And I was like, yes? And she said, and she said, yeah. And I said, and at that moment, I realized I, this was my second trip to Cuba, and I'd be getting the runaround. And um, it was right after the Soviets had pulled the rug out, so it was an unusual time. And I said, um, and by, at that moment, I realized I needed to move there with my family. That as long as I visited, I would be treated as a kind of tourista, and I would never get under the surface of things. And so I said, enough to move, that I move here with my wife and kids? And she said, yes. And that's what I did. But it took a year and a half to get her to really open up. And I began to then get the okay from people. Because of her? People, she was like the mostly key Mostly because of her. I also had the, I, had the green, I had the green light from the regime. But it was not a red carpet. 
And they, there was a kind of duality in it. As the longer I was there, I was aware there were different groups. And, um, but she was the ultimate, you know, she was the ultimate treasure trophy because she was sitting on unpublished diaries of her husband. And I gradually began to receive them from her, which was extraordinary. It turns out Che was not just a, you know, adventurer, guerrilla, fighter, but he wrote his entire life. He, that we all knew the Bolivian diary, but there were several others and I had first access to them. And this allowed me to see this man and his private thoughts in a way nobody had ever had. People that hadn't ever spoken, that were keepers of the flame for the past 30 years also opened up to me. And so I began to talk with them regularly. I traveled with his old friend Granado from the Motorcycle Diaries together to Argentina. These guys all, we traveled and hung out with the boyhood friends. And over time, they returned to their boyhoods and opened up to me. But just reporting it wasn't enough. I knew that he had an inner life and I needed that inner life. And that was where my access, I got my access. And that's what I achieved through my access in Cuba. And it was, why did she? I don't know. I think I came along at the right time. We clicked in a curious way. We clicked. How did she feel afterwards? With, I mean, when she saw the results? I never found out. Did she pass away or no, did you never No, she's still asked? alive. Okay. But and I, I knew that she was, I, it, it, she let it be known that she was pissed off at me. So and, and, then, and then about 10 years passed and she let it be known that I was no longer on her shit list. But the reason, the reason she gave that she was pissed off at me was because I had, according to her, violated, uh, it, it had to do with, um, Pudor. It had to do with um, uh, her shyness. So, when, before she met Che, she was an underground courier in the in the revolutionary underground, and Batista's police had her on their police files by a crude nickname, Teta Manchada. In other words, stained tit. It's it is pretty crude, because she has a birthmark on one of her breasts, and she didn't want this known. She claimed. But I learned this, and I put it in the book. So she claimed that I had, you know, she, but I think it was just an excuse. What happened in, in, in Cuba was that pretty much everybody that had worked closely with me, because it's Cuba, and because of the nature of Cuba, and the fact that this was not a, his, this was not a hagiography, I wrote my book, which I always told them I was going to do. Um, it, it, it was quite different to the official, uh, you know, version. So they all took a kind of, I think, a healthy step back from me for a while. Yeah. But maybe we'll, we'll end on that, because however close you get to life, and obviously, you know, the New Yorker lets you do that so much more than the kind of stories that most of us have to do. Do you, in general, find that the people who are part of the story that you wrote about f feel happy with the result? Because in my experience, which is largely in television, people are always angry simply because the way they see themselves is not the way that they look to other people. And when that rupture happens, it's always very, very strong, especially in TV, because yes. it's visual as well. Do you, do you, do you find that's an inevitability? Um, it, 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 not to the same degree, but it, it does happen sometimes. Um, I always make sure that, for, um, I never lie to anybody. I never lie. Something I just said a moment ago was, I'm always very clear in when I approach people. And I use diplomacy, but I never lie. So, you know, you go into this dance. I've met lots of diplomats who'd like to say that. As well. I know, but it's true. So in other words, I don't say, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a violin concerto about you. You may, in the course of your relationship with a story subject, become aware that that's what they hope. And you know that you're not going to do that. But I, I try to make it as explicit as possible without losing the access. But it's not as cynical as it sounds. I know that in, when we do short-term reporting, it seems a very cynical exercise sometimes. And sometimes you have to save people from themselves, which is another thing you learn with time. Otherwise, you make some ter terrible moral errors, I think, along the way. You can really wound and hurt people forever. But I try to, um, I mean, most of my profilees are figures of power. So sure, it's which not is, like, that's easier. It's yeah. not like we're spooning in bed by the time the, the relationship ends. 
<laughs> you know, there's only, I've only written I, about two colleagues. One was Gabriel Garcia Marquez, whom I loved. Uh -huh. But I still wrote a, a profile that he was pissed off about. Why? Why was he pissed off? Oh, I don't know. He got pissed off about it. But for about 10 years, he didn't talk to me. But then, <laughs> but then, but, but his family and we became, I became drawn into his circle anyway. And by the end of his life, um, everything was fine. But initially, I think it's hard to see yourself in stark print like that. Um, he also got sick and he had, um, uh, in the course of my reporting on him, he got, he started suffering from lymphoma and began undergoing kind of radiotherapy and chemotherapy and I think it zapped his memory and he, he had issues with, he thought that he, his big obsession was not talking out of shop about his friendship with Fidel. And he did talk to me about it and he said, don't write this and I didn't. There were certain things that were on the record mm -hmm. and others that weren't, but he, thought that I had violated that for a while. Mm. But it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, long lasting. I heard, I heard one comment through the grapevine, but I was still in a good stead with all the people around him. But again, he's a co he was a kind of colleague, mm. even though he was a Nobel Prize winning older generation colleague. And one other, everybody else, there's been a certain amount of, you know, there's been an, a somewhat adversarial mm. relationship by necessity because they were figures of power. So, yeah, I don't know, but the, that, that, yeah, the that powerful of fair game, right. but as soon as you go deeper, it's very complicated. I think we have to finish, because we're not going to run over. Um, any, last, any, any, any last words? Yeah, do you guys, do you, do you, do you have questions? What's our, yeah, what's our time frame? We have a little time? We're doing Georgian style today. A little time, a little bit later. We have some time, okay. okay. It's flexible. Okay, any questions? I've got some questions, no. I've had some. Gentlemen here. Thank you. Um, there's a little bit of a danger when you have two men talking about long form journalism that it can come, become a little bit of a, a masturbate. It, it's a little bit of a danger sometimes when you have two men talking about long form journalism that it becomes a bit masturbatory. Who, you didn't because you're both brilliant. You write long form in a way that 3,000 words of yours is like reading 300 words of other people's. Who are you liking at the moment? Where do you see innovation coming at the moment in the long form? Because I, I see it partly in Coda, but where do you, where do you see, what, what are you liking that's new at the moment? Both of you, please. What, what, what do I like? Well, there's this book coming out in August which really questions the form of long form as, as it relates it. It is, yeah, funnily enough. Um, I mean, I, th I, think, I think we're in, look, multimedia, obviously, and, and this whole kind of, it's new. There's just so much experimentation that Coda do and just the coming together of different genres, especially somebody like me, whose background is TV, who migrated to print because print allowed me to do things that TV didn't allow me to do. I mean, the idea of reuniting my various knowledges in a third thing. And I don't think anyone's cracked it yet, by the way. There's so much experimentation. I don't, you know, it's still, it's still in be in the process of becoming, but that's, you know, that's, that's where it's at, really. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I'm fascinated by all the various genres. For me, I mean, although what I do is I write, and that's what I have most done, um, I'm fascinated by all the other genres of storytelling, and when it's been my opportunity to cooperate, collaborate with somebody, or however, in however, however small a way, I usually seize the opportunity. Nobody's ever asked me to do an opera yet, but I'm fascinated by every opportunity to tell a story in a different way, reach new audiences. Um, a couple of years ago, my, my publisher is a young guy in Mexico, um, uh, proposed that we do a graphic novel based on my book. And we chose together an illustrator, a graphic novelist in Mexico, and it became, he did it in three parts over three years, and. This last year, it came out in English, in an omnibus edition. And it's quite fascinating. It was fascinating to do this because it, it was, you know, first of all, I had to take a step back. I had to allow a certain amount of poetic license to the illustrator, to the graphic novelist. Um, and, uh, and this posed challenges to me, and I always think a challenge is good. Um, so. I've, I've not seen the pop-up magazine, which I've heard about. It sounds fascinating, this idea of performing um, your stories and finding different ways to use 
film and but the first night of coda i thought the coda live the three i saw were extraordinary and they were each very different i was really excited by that i found that was um fun and uh moving in some cases and um i once did a moth thing uh, which allowed me to tell a story that i hadn't really told in print uh, in a different way and uh and and having a producer who was accustomed to working with people who were writers, but getting them on stage and to tell it or tell their story orally, being edited in that way, produced, and you know, this is what you can do, this is what you need to do when you're standing up on stage in front of people, rather than what you do in print, was a real learning experience for me. And I think the more all of us do any of that, it's it may, makes this it makes this more fun, more interesting, and we have the potential of reaching more people. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, mm. Mm. it was really interesting talk. <coughs> the question is, you write long pieces. Do you use dram dramaturgy, let's say, because I have this feeling, uh, the difference between journalism and fiction, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a line, quite a, quite a tricky one. I have this feeling I, I did a lot of news reporting and after I went to documentary films and in documentary films sometimes I feel a necessity to, to use another ling language which is a fiction. So how, uh -huh. how you play with this in, in the long term? And, and to add to that, the question of structure, do you think in terms of three act structures, the way you would in fiction or in film, I mean, do you start breaking it down with high points, reverse points, resolutions, catharsis, or are you still thinking in terms of kind of journalistic rules? I don't think, I, either of the, I, neither of those, it's not as conscious with me. I mean, I will sit down and try to, f I think in terms of scenes, because I, I think visually, I write visually, but also for the way we do s pieces in The New Yorker, you, you think in terms of scenes. Um, so I don't think in terms of three acts necessarily, but um, it may ultimately conform to that. I usually, I'm looking for between six and um, 10 scenes. If I'm lucky, I'll have scenes. And what I mean is, you know, it, it, what it does is it breaks up this kind of digestive information or chronology where you can, f you can show, not tell, and you can live within the piece and you can suspend time. So these are all obviously also theatrical or dramatic devices. And yes, the, some of the uh, instruments of fiction or of drama dramatization are inherent to the work of uh, in long-form journalism you want to uh, entice you want to create suspense if you have it you want to uh, you want to ring out bring out emotion from your reader if I have cried in, in an experience I want my reader to cry you know, I want them to feel the emotion I've felt. Um, and um, if I find that there's an, a, a, an absurd moment that is somehow funny or profound and long lasting in my memory, I want them to feel that absurdity too. It's a very difficult thing to write. So you have to be aware of the attention span of the reader. You don't want to overburden them with too much dry history. You want to find a way to tell that history, maybe someone's life story, maybe they're telling it to you or you're living it with them. Um, I, I Once, for instance, uh, in New Orleans, actually, again, Thomas and I were there together. I um, unexpectedly, I found a, a guy who they were calling holdouts. They wouldn't leave their homes. Turned out to be a man who'd been, you know, it was, it was also a very racialist, situ a racial situation. This man agreed to come on this, um, wave runner i was on the back of a wave runner with a woman who went out and was looking for people who were still in their houses and we had, anyway he agreed to get on the the back of, and he hung on to me he'd been there for 10 days he was an older man he'd had to leave his dog behind he was very emotionally overwrought it was a very poignant moment and because of the toxic water there were bodies there was chemicals it was awful your eyes stung um, everything that touched the water became encrusted by chemical, you know, formations later. And we had to go very, very slowly to get back about maybe nine or ten blocks to dry land. So this was the neighborhood he had lived his entire life in, where he went to high school. 
He, was, he also made wrought iron. And so he'd build up his own business and he made these wrought iron, you know, um, what do you call them, for windows. And he'd seen his, he put his kids into school, they'd gone off to college, but some of the families in the neighborhood, the, they had succumbed to drugs, whatever. In this 40 minute, as it turned out, this 40 minute drive, he narrated the history of the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans to me, and also the racial divide by extension. And I didn't really need to do very much. It was a scene that was extraordinary, you know, as he unburdened himself and told me everything I was seeing. So I wasn't just going through a flooded neighborhood now. I was going through the history of the last 60 years of New Orleans and its, its extreme racial divide. And that was extraordinary, but it doesn't often happen like that. So that was kind of manna from heaven, you know what I mean? But yes, you can use drama, you can use dramatic uh, devices, or what should I say, the instruments of fiction storytelling without fictionalizing. You know, where we can maybe get a little artful is in the use of time. I may begin a story um, at a further point in the story than it actually began. But in the course of reading it, you know, the, the reader understands that that's what I've done. We're now uh, accustomed to that. And you can, you know, it's unusual for me for in particular to do a kind of Tarantino where it's constantly flip-flopping, you know what I mean? Uh, in time, you playing with time. But you can go backwards and forwards with time, but you can't confuse the reader. The reader needs to be moored or anchored so that they have a fixed point, a guiding point. And whether it's the personality or the story that you're unfolding, that allows you to um, move them through this drama, this suspenseful drama, perhaps, that you're, you've created for them. But you're telling them a true story. But also, as, as you were just speaking, I was also wondering, maybe in, a, in another way, we'll work within the conventions of fiction. Because think about how you've been describing character during the course of this conversation. Someone has a real life, a public life. A diary reveals them. We are, you are talking about the conventions of the 19th century psychological novel, essentially, and the 20th century. So I think we all dwell within that. And some of the most interesting nonfiction, I feel, might be the ones that will start questioning that. What is, what is a character? What is a personality? Um, one of my favorite books, fiction books, is, is Things by, by George Paresh, which describes people not through their psychology, he's kind of rejecting that even exists, but just through their objects, through their things. It's sort of slightly left-wing critique of consumer society. I'd love to describe someone just through their data, for example. So actually, I think, just through their data, can we use data to s describe a life or describe a scene? So I think we actually dwell within the conventions of fiction and philosophy to, a, to an extent that maybe we don't even notice. Um, and maybe it would be fun to, to play with that sometimes. Yeah. I think we have to, are we gonna let this person have their question? Yeah. Yeah, it's maybe, do they, do uh, they have the right? They have the right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I think it's connected to the question before. I'm a freelance reporter uh, from Germany and we had this huge fake scandal with Spiegel, with uh, Klaus Relotius faking the stories. Now there is a huge discussion actually since months going on, what's actually allowed in long sh uh, form storytelling so I would like to know if um, these things, like what's actually allowed to change during your career and to like, yeah, have a clear question. Do you think, for example, it's allowed, would you uh, combine three or four characters in one ever? Uh, or would you put things that happened in different days in one day, pretending that it all happened on Wednesday, let's say, just although one of these events happened on Tuesday, just because nothing else happened, interesting happened on Tuesday and you actually would skip this day, kind of. Uh, so what, what's, uh, and would you say we have now more strict times as there was like 30, 40 years ago where actually, I mean, these things were taught in German, uh, uh, yeah, universities that it's okay to do that 30 years ago, you know, and now people are losing their careers because of that. C combining characters, I think, is, is, is not, but the squeezing time question, I think, is very relevant. So one friend of mine, Oliver Bulo, I asked him about this, because I came from TV, where you can never squeeze characters, but in TV, we squeeze time all the time. We make something feel 
that it happened. We just never say it was the same day, but you edit it together to make it feel that way. And that's a sleight of hand that was accepted in documentaries. So I asked a friend of mine how he does it, because it would be very tedious for the reader to say, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. He just says at the start, look, this is what I've done. At the start of the book, he says, I have squeezed time to make it better for you, to make it more readable. Uh, and that seemed to be okay for him. So it's almost like a game sometimes, or a contract with the reader. This what, is what, what I've done. What, what country is he from? Well, he's British and a Reuters guy. So, so his background was really strict. And he said, that's the way that I do it, which I thought was quite a nice way. Mm. Um, but that's in book, in a book. Yeah, yeah, so when he went from articles to a book. Um, I mean, in, in Britain, it's, still, it's less Calvinistic than in, in, in journalism. Than in, especially in daily journalism, than in the United States, it's an it's absolute no no to do the composite characters. A number there's a number of famous cases: Michael Finkel, uh, others that I've heard, Phil Glass and uh, Janet, whatever her name was. Um, you know, they all committed this sin of creating the character they knew existed or existed in the form of several people and uh, were unmasked for having done this and you know, shamed in public and their careers were over. Finkel actually has uh, bounced back by writing about it and it became a movie. So he's one of these people that probably should have been in fiction in the first place. Um, you know, um, but if, you, you know, I think the problem is, and there's a, whole, there's a whole, we could have a whole side discussion about, say, Kapuscinski. He's a wonderful writer. His books are iconic. I never, ever, you know, it was funny, it wasn't until the controversy about the fact that he had created this kind of, his own genre, that I really thought about it. I, I think I always thought of him as a, just a writer, not really as a journalist. His error, I believe, was in presenting what he did as straight journalism, when in fact, he, you know, he really played with it. Garcia Marquez, as a young journalist, did the same thing. He was a he worked as a journalist, but was a fiction writer in his soul, and was always bursting to get out. So he told basically tall tales, really? which everybody loved, <laughs> but were not entirely true. And even today in Latin America, there's a different approach to this. I'm, I go there a lot, so I know, and I have a couple of colleagues who did this, who've done this, and you know, if they were Amer North Americans and had done this, create a character to make a story better, you know, it would be the end of their career. So, so, but but so it's Marcus, still done, they still don't have the same approach to, to uh, fact, I guess, as we do. In the I, I love the idea that actually Marcus's magic realism is one long apology <laughs> for his journalistic sins. Like, reality doesn't really exist. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean... But what about the time question? Because I think, yeah, composite characters are... But time is one that, you know, especially as you move to long form, or do you just... Is it okay to squeeze time? You know, I don't... Or do you just skirt around it? I, you know, I, I think maybe allied is probably the best word. I don't... I, I, I like to mark the time. I think marking time is important. But there, are, you can begin a section or a scene that's not set in time and reveal that time in the course of that scene. These are techniques. It's, it's not... You're not obviating the time. You're not... You may create a scene in which the reader believes he or she is at a certain moment, but ultimately you let them know when that was. You don't, um, you can be artful without falsifying the time. I never alter the time entirely. But, but if you look, think of- It may give the impression, yeah. of, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here because I'm not really sure, but I'm quite conscious, but, I, don't, I don't think I- But let's say not you, let's say the, gr the, the, the great, I don't know the who here has read, read Gay Teleza, who's my favorite New Yorker writer, who really defined what is a portrait. Yeah, he kind of defined the genre, and we all grow up reading him and wanting to be like him. And he has this legendary portrait of a boxer, and it's kind of this, this boxer who always lost in the finals, and it's incredible, his life, and a, a day in the guy's life. And then I found out later, he spent like three years interviewing him, and he's completely made it feel like one visit. And I, I, what, what was, was, was that okay? And because that is, Telez is presented as the ultimate profile writer, if you're a journalism school. Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, I would have to re read it again and reevaluate it. I think it's okay as long as you're not, you're not, you're not changing the date, you know. I mean, he doesn't give you a date. He's like, yeah. Well, so, he, so no, because you're, pro with, you're, pr you're profiling a person who is living beyond their life and your life. 
you know, you're setting them in time, you're setting them in history. Um, and I think, um, you know, we will very often use the device, you know, one day last spring, or one day last spring, or, you know, one day last year. And sometimes you do that because you don't want to say it was longer ago than it really was. So I suppose there's a certain amount of artifice in that, but it feels, in, in the larger scheme of things, a fairly tame form of, uh, of dramatic device, you know, of, uh, yeah, so, I don't know. I, I think anyway. it's about the relationship with, with the reader. I think every piece of writing is always exactly. a step away from, from, <laughs> from, from reality, always, if just by the nature of language. Mm. I think it's about that contract with the reader. Does the reader understand that you're doing it? And is it a conscious yes, deception? Yes, exactly. I, I think yeah. so. I think it's that. Really. I think if you, if you were to, to read about a character you thought was real and then learned, out, learned that they weren't, you know, I think that that's where the error is. Um, so, uh, and in this case, I think we, yeah, I think exactly. It, you, it's the, the, ultimately, it will the reader and the reading public d determines what's acceptable or not. But so many great interviews one does do, especially interviews one does over a long period of time, and then on the page, they might flow as if it's one conversation. Doesn't that happen, do you find? Or do you, would you break that up into two days later we met again and continued the conversation about his mother? Or would you just give it as one, one, one conversation? I mean, I would have to think about it. I mean, I think, I think I, before, just before answering, I would have to think about a specific case. But I think, um, I think again, it's not as important to... Um, I think it's. I think I agree with you that the time is not as important as this idea of multiple identity. Yeah, uh, but in general, I think I would try to. I would try to write it as it happened, um, and then. You know, and then in the in the editing, I suppose when you're trying to conf when you have to conflate, for uh, for the purposes of story, you may lose you may lose some of the signposting. But for me, it's quite important to have it there. That's me. Again, I think there may be other writers where it's not such an issue. But for me, it's quite important. Okay, we're half an hour over. This is late even by Georgian times, isn't it? And they're judging, like, you know, how long, how long it took me to get my cheese plate yesterday downstairs. Maybe this isn't late. But um, I think we've got to row. Yeah, there are, there are other people who need, who need to go. Come on. And Lindsay is up next. Yeah, and I see Anshel's made it amazingly. My uh, God. It's his birthday today. He He's got a big day. Oh. Not his, not his birthday today, not his birthday today. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.